dollars today i'm going to be talking about tellurin i'm going to give a brief overview of tellurin because i think i've gotten a, a number of comments from folks who are newly interested in the company uh from some of the recent news and um, then i'm going to go in and talk in some detail on just giving some of my thoughts on what i think some of these uh stories have come out recently you know, about them hiring a financial advisor could mean for the company and, and you know a couple different options and what what that could uh could mean for us as investors so before i begin let me remind you that i'm not a financial advisor or financial professional of any sort all opinions that i express in this video are mine and do not represent those of any company or any other individual um, I currently hold a long position in Tellurian, so this video should be for your entertainment purposes only because I could be wrong about everything they say in this video. You need to do your own research before making any investment decisions. Okay, so again, I'm going to make this brief because I know a lot of my viewers are very well um, versed in the company, but I'm briefly will review Tellurian because it is relevant to discussing the options. So, you know, Tellurian, they want to be uh, an exporter of U.S. natural gas, of liquefied natural gas, and... In particular, the thing that made Tellurian unique versus other LNG exporters was that they wanted to be fully integrated, right? They wanted to own the upstream operations. They want to produce cheap U.S. gas and then liquefy it and sell it internationally. And they wanted to capture that spread and, and get their profits from, you know, the arbitrage between those two and being able to own that entire, um, all of their costs by owning their upstream operations. So you, in the past, you'd hear the company talk about having a, a physical hedge, meaning they literally own the, the pipes and the wells and they're producing the gas themselves they put themselves in a position to be able to produce gas fairly cheaply and take on that risk that you know international prices are generally uh the, the risk of between international prices and u.s natural gas prices and since they control the costs they could actually have visibility into that and and again capture that spread as their profits um and so that's what really made them unique as sort of a fully integrated pure play LNG uh, exporter, as I say. Um, now, on the flip side, let's talk about what Tellurian is right now, because they are not doing that quite yet. Um, right now, they are a small U.S. natural gas producer uh, with a partially built LNG liquefaction facility uh, with some balance sheet problems, right? And I say they're a small U.S. natural gas producer because that's where they actually generate revenue right now. That's what they have for actual operations. Um, in Q3 of 2023, they produced just shy of 20 BCF. Uh, you know, that made about $10 million in EBITDA. Um, and, and again, they have the the thing that makes Tellurian very interesting, why I think most of us are interested versus just viewing it as a natural gas producer, is the Driftwood LNG facility. You know, and they started construction on that, what was it, in early of... 2022? Am I getting my years right? Maybe, maybe I'm wrong by year, but they've they've done significant construction. Gosh, I, I really hope I, I'm, I'm not messing that up. Uh, I've been investing in the company for, for a while, all kinds of blends together. Um, but, you know, they've done substantial uh, work under a limited notice to proceed. They do not have the full funding to do the full notice to proceed to, to build the first phase. Um, but they've done a bunch of the site prep work and they have things basically ready to go, and they've they've compressed the timeline that it will take in order to be able to produce LNG. Um, but they they don't yet have everything yet, and they kind of are at a stopping point now, I think, in terms of what they can actually fund for initial development of the site. And so they have this site; it is fully permitted um, and approved. And they've got Bechtel; they've got contracts with Bechtel that they they're waiting to execute, but they they haven't been able to line up the financing. And so that is roughly the state of you know driftwood in a very very short uh, summary but tellurian itself has balance sheet problems as i said and i'll pull up their their most recent quarterly report real quick and you can just uh, this i'm not going to go through this in too much detail but you can see real quick they have you know 96 million dollars of current assets you know most of their assets are in pp and e that is not liquid you know that that's the, the driftwood facility and some of their upstream assets and then you look at their their current liabilities. You know it's 156 million dollars, and their their operations are not going to um, close that gap anytime soon. You know, and they have even further liabilities that are due in the next couple of years that total up e e even more, right? Um, of in, to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars. And if they are not able to move forward with with well. Sorry, I'll talk about some of those things, the aspects of this in a minute. But suffice it to say, you know, the balance sheet is not in a very healthy state right now. Their gas operations as they exist today are, are not going to be supportive of them being able to continue on with this path. And so that's where, you know, you saw in the shareholder letter 
that they had. Um, let me pull this forward. Shareholder letter that Martin put out uh, at the end of December. There's this bullet point here where he said, we have appointed a financial advisor to assist with shaping commercial structures as well as balance sheet management. This is going to be the focus of my video today because it wasn't really clear what this meant at the time. It was a very open-ended statement. Um, you know, it could mean everything from we are trying to get some, you know, guidance and some uh, help from the, from the board's perspective, right? Some sort of liability protection by having a third party review some things in terms of the deals that we want to make all the way to we're looking to sell the company. And that's what I'm going to talk through a bit today. Um, hi, Travis and hi, Wakaza. Thanks for hopping on the stream. Sorry, I, I didn't get to you earlier. I wanted to kind of get through my initial preamble for this video. Um, one other thing, sorry, as I'm, I'm looking through my notes, I should mention part of the value proposition for why Tellurian is still interesting right now, you know, as an investment and as a as a, an LNG exporter is because they have already done this partial construction on the Driftwood LNG facility. They are one of the few options that remain probably globally, I think um, almost certainly the only option in the US that could probably still sign up new capacity if they had the if they had the money tomorrow and get gas on the water in you know 2027 uh there's lots of facilities there not lots but there are more facilities around that could make this happen but you know it's going to take a, a longer lead time in order for them to actually get things ramped up and, and into production so they can actually ship lng and then there was the recent um announcement just this week that lng that uh you know lng approvals were paused um, I could probably open that up real quick. If you haven't seen this, this was, you know, the Biden administration just, what's this, two days ago, announced, you know, a temporary pause on approving uh, natural gas exports. And this only applied to, it, it only applied to the facilities that were not already approved, right? So Torian already has these approvals. Um, and so I think they are not affected by this. But if someone else is trying to, you know, put together a project so they can then get uh, gas, you know, to, to uh, somewhere else, liquefied natural gas, this is making, this is just adding one more obstacle, right? We don't know how long this pause is going to go on for. You know, it's clearly, sorry, uh, mostly going to keep politics out of this, but it surely looks like this is politically motivated. You can talk about, or you can speculate, let's say, about how this might play into elections this year and, and all of that stuff. But this is one more hurdle for new facilities to come online. Since Tellurian already has all these approvals and has spare capacity, they've got the site already prepped. That's really the largest value proposition for Driftwood as it stands right now uh, is, is to be you know, one of the shortest time periods for somebody who has money and wants to get LNG in the future. So hopefully that gives you some overview there. Um, sorry, I see a couple uh, couple uh, messages in the chat. Let's see, well, Kaza says, why they ousted the guy and is that bad? How does it make you feel and what would you prefer? Thanks in advance. Uh, I will talk about that um, a, a little bit later. I'm going to talk through. Um, so I'm going to let's put a pin in that. Um, and, and I promise I will come back to your to your question about uh, what, what happened to, to Suki. Um, Nathan says, I'm buying more Monday. What's your take on the possible stock price if it does go for sale? Three to five. I will talk through that. That is part of my prepared material. So I'm going to try to go through some of these these options and just the way that I see it and what I what I'm reading out of this. And again, let me preface all of it by saying, you know, not financial advice. I'm not a financial professional or financial advisor, but just giving you, you know, some of my thoughts. So hopefully that helps you with your own thinking here. Um, anyway, so let me go get into that. And what's actually new this week, in addition to the LNG pause that I think is technically a positive for Tellurian because it's making it harder for other facilities to come online in the short term. This is what we saw, right? We, we got a, a little more clarity on... And sorry, I don't have the full full article here. I, I have seen it previously. Um, I just didn't quite get it quite up with, with this account and, and where I'm at. Um, Tellurian hires Lazard, and I, I'm, I'm going to pronounce it that way. Hopefully that's correct. To explore a sale of U.S. natural gas developer, right? And so this article sure made it sound like they're looking to sell the company. And I think there's a quote out of here that, that I that I copied. Um, you know, it has hired them to explore commercial opportunities and options under consideration include a potential sale of the company according to people familiar with the situation. So again, that's fairly non-committal, um, but that is all the way on this side of the spectrum here. You know, I said there, there's a bunch of, of, of options that what Martin's initial bullet point of, hey, we hired a, an advisor. Um, that's certainly one of the options. We're just going to sell the whole company. Um, 
we got this other article from Reuters that had a slight, a very non-committal statement, even from a spokesperson of Tellurian. Where is it down here? Yeah, so I have it highlighted. Uh, Joy Lexnar, uh, who is the spokesperson, she's a someone from from the actual company. She said, "I can confirm we hired Lazard, and they are helping us as we seek equity partners." And so, this is again a very non-committal statement where it's ambiguous. Does that mean that they are helping them? You know, what are they helping them them with in particular? Uh, they they really aren't providing a whole lot. They're not giving this us any transparency, which is, I think, you know, you do have the trust management that they're, they're not, they've clearly changed some of their strategy with Suki not being there anymore, where they're, they're having a little bit less transparency and not trying to hold all their, all their cards on the table. They're holding them closer to their chest and we don't know quite what they're doing. It, it is possible they're looking for the sale of the company. It's also possible that they're using some of that as a, um, you know, as some data that they're using in, in negotiations or to set pricing and, who knows? Um, we, we really don't. But I did want to talk through some of these options that it could be. Um, if they do actually sell something, right? If they're just hiring them, that they end up giving them some comps and some numbers or comps, meaning, you know, comparables that they use in, in negotiations. They use the whole firm on, on where they should be in pricing. And then they actually get a deal done that's closer to, you know, what they propose in the past. And, and just when I say that, I mean, um, you know, this was the example structure that this had hey we're trying to get to we were trying to to structure a deal that looks like this and i think the number some of the numbers could change and and again it's the, the most benign um interpretation of well we're having them help us as we seek equity partners is they are talking to this uh to this extra firm to do some some of their own analysis help them set the pricing on you know what's the equity going to be what what might their offtake agreements have to be priced at and this, you know, it could just be that they are using a third party now to get the board as a sort of, uh, you know, to cover themselves from a liability perspective, because if a third party says these are reasonable ranges, this is, you know, what you, uh, this is a reasonable deal to be made, then, you know, it's really hard in the future for somebody to come back on them and, and sue them for, you know, breach of fiduciary responsibility or anything like that. Because I know there's been a lot of the talk um, in the past with Sharif Suki, where he said, we're holding out for the best possible deal. And, you know, again, this is just one possible theory uh, among among many. It could be that the primary purpose of having this third party is for them to, be, to have some concrete numbers to say, we talked to a third party, they said these were reasonable options. And so, you know, we went with this. It's not the deal that we wanted to do a year ago. It's not even the deal that maybe, maybe it's worse than deals we had on the table in 2022 when things were looking much, much better for the company. And, you know, that they they didn't end up signing those deals. Now that they go with a much worse deal, maybe this is a way for the board to actually cover themselves and have some liability protection where they say, hey, this is a third party. They're, you know, investment bankers. And, you know, we follow some of their advice. So it's, it's hard to really say that they didn't do their their job for the current shareholders in that sort of a scenario. Um, now, it could go th that that's like, as I said, the most benign scenario. Now, I think there's some other possibilities here, right? And, and they do need to get something done. And, and if I was going to call out one major conclusion to this, to them actually saying that they hired somebody that they're uh, looking to get some advice and make some deals, it is that they want to do something quickly. And I think that is the absolute biggest message that I'm getting that I'm that is unambiguous from the company is we want to get some transaction done. It's not clear yet what that transaction is. And like I say, the the, the least uh, diversion from what they've said in the past would be that they end up just doing something similar to what they've said in the past. Now, it could be more drastic. They could be selling part of the business. And I think, you know, there's there's two large assets to the business, right? They have the upstream gas producing assets, and then they have driftwood itself. And I guess I would lump in the pipelines with the gas producing assets. And, you know, so if we look at you know, selling the upstream gas producing assets only and retaining driftwood. That is an option. You know, th they could do that. This would be basically throwing away the any chance of being vertically integrated, right? This, this would would mean that they are like most of the other US LNG export companies and facilities where they don't own the upstream, they, they purchase it, they get it from someone else. And if that were to be the case, you know, I think this is possible for them. 
that to me would be a big signal. You know, if they say anything along those lines, it's a big signal to me that they're, you know, obviously they're no longer fully integrated, but also probably means that they are switching almost entirely to the sort of tolling business model for their offtake agreements. Um, you know, because I think in the past, the business proposition and the business strategy made sense to to not use the standard tolling contracts for your LNG uh, and instead to actually sell based on you know international commodity prices on on um, you know TTF or JKM because you can control your production costs right so Henry Hub prices can go through the roof but if if you're still paying people and still own the wells it doesn't matter if if it's in very high demand to someone else you can still produce your own gas right you actually control that and so that allowed them to really have the confidence that they can still produce cheaply and sell at the international prices. But, you know, if you're purchasing from someone else because they've sold their, their gas production assets, then to me, that's a big sign that they're probably not going to be able to capture that spread anymore, right? They're going to be targeting just these tolling contracts because that's what's um, reasonable for them to do since they don't actually control that as an input cost, the, you know, the, the price of Henry Hub gas. So that I think would be possible. I, I tried to do a quick ballpark comparison. I did not do you know in-depth research because frankly, I'm just not enough of an industry expert to know what bleeding edge pricing might be for these things or even just reasonable pricing. Um, I did just a super, super quick comp to give an order of magnitude here. And I looked at, this is a company I've, I've used in the past when I talked about what could you know potential plan B liquidation value or, or plan B valuation for Tellurian B. I look at the you know CNX Resources Corporation because I think they're a, they're a natural gas producer primarily, and they're not humongous. Um, and so I looked at them and I look at their their guidance for 2024 would be that they're going to produce, if I'm understanding this correctly, you know between 570 590 uh, BCF in 2024. And so you pull out your, your quick calculator and you can see, so they're at 580 in Tellurian. Well, let's do Tellurian. Right? Tellurian said that they're at about 200 mmCF uh, per day. And so that would be actually, I guess, 0.2 BCF per day. Call it 365 days per year. Per year. They're producing about 73 uh, BCF per year. And so that is, you know, divide that over 580 as the average of their guidance. That is, you know, 12.5% here of what this company produces in terms of gas. And so if we go just in terms of production and, and again this is just a quick quick check they're at a 3.162 billion market cap multiply you know Tellurian is a much smaller producer so if they were to sell those assets you know times 3.162 maybe we could look to see so that's in that would be in billions multiplied by a thousand to get to millions maybe this is about 400 million dollars at rough current market pricing for their upstream natural gas assets you know for, for that amount of, of production that, that's just like Super quick. I think there's lots of dimensions you could actually look at in terms of like how much acreage is it? Blah. How much acreage do they own? How much, you know, gas reserves do they have? So there, there's a lot of ways that I'm just frankly not enough of an industry expert to really compare. I'm just looking at sort of their current year production because I, I'm hoping that this is a, a halfway decent valuation. Uh, again, just to get an order of magnitude here. So if we looked at that $400 million, that would be a pretty big boost to learn that would let them pay off, you know, all of their short term debt and give them some cash in the bank um, to give them some wiggle room to be able to maneuver and, and get things together for driftwood. Again, I think if they did that, that would probably put them solely able to do tolling contracts, not able to do, you know, sell on, on JKM or TTF. And, you know, those are a lot lower. Um, they have lower profit potential, right? As we've seen, and as you see with, you know, next decade uh for full transparency purposes i also hold a long position in, in next decade um but uh sorry i saw a question on the chat how many shares do you own um i don't want to give a specific number let's say more than ten thousand, less than a hundred thousand um so that hopefully gives you uh some some idea that i it's not like five shares and it's not a million shares um for me, it, I've put a substantial amount of, of money into the company. I'm down pretty st significantly at this point, as most people are who, who didn't just, you know, buy in the past couple months. Um, all right. So that is kind of one option is that they sell the upstream natural gas assets. Now, on the flip side, they could sell driftwood, of course. Um, 
Now, I don't see them selling only driftwood as a reasonable option, right? Because that that would actually mean they're, they're selling off the LNG export facility and now they keep the gas production and they're just a gas producer. Um, that doesn't make sense to me from any of the board of directors or, or the current exec executives. I'm just not sure that that's the direction that they would want to take the company as just being a, a gas producer. I could be wrong, but I, I find that hard to believe. You know, Tellurian was... Uh, co-founded by, by Shreef Suki and Martin Houston to based on this particular site, right? If I understand the founding story correctly, uh, Martin had actually found the site and brought it to Suki, you know, when he was at Chenier and Chenier ended up not, not being interested in it for one reason or another. I think that's a whole, it's a whole story that I think had some sort of a lawsuit associated with it. Um, I won't go into details here, but the, you know, they created the company in order to actually do the LNG export. I don't think that they would want to pivot into just being a natural gas producer. So that seems highly unlikely. Um, now, so, so I'm, I'm sort of just not even going to think that that's a possibility, but they could sell the whole company. You know, this is possible. Uh, this one is really hard. I don't think that there are any good comparables out there that we could take a look at um, because you know, again, Tellurian is a bit of an interesting company. There's, I don't think there's been a whole lot of f these LNG export facilities that have been sold. And it's hard to actually, a lot of them are private, so it's hard to really know what their valuation is. The ones that are public, I think a lot of them are much further along or, you know, next decade. It's it just, there, there's so much nuance to it. That's really hard for me to, to get any, any guess at, um, you know, any reasonable guess. But at the same time, I sort of already estimated, I think you get $400 million for the gas portion of the business um, based on my, you know, I, I just walked through that quick model for you over here. And for Driftwood, it's really hard for me to see, you know, I think they've talked about investing a, somewhere between a billion to one and a half billion dollars just of their own money into, you know, getting all the permits and getting all the engineering and even the site prep work that they've done so far. It's hard to imagine that they get less money than that, you know, so let's just call it a billion. Let's try to do what I think would be a low ball for, for Driftwood if I was trying to actually value the assets. Now, again, there's no guarantee that they would get this much money. You know, it's all, it's whatever somebody would pay for it if they go this route. But hypothetically, I'd be really surprised if they got less than the cash that they say that they've put into it. They say that's about a billion dollars. And so if you, let's say, you know, about a billion dollars for Driftwood, about $400 million for the gas assets. Let's round it off to, you know, $1.5 billion if they got that amount for the whole company. So what would that look like? I think they'd have to, you know, let me go back to their balance sheet, right? I think if, if you go through the, the assets and the liabilities, subtract it out and you figure there's roughly about $400 million of net liabilities right now. So if they, if they sold the company, if they valued it, at, you know, th those assets, ignoring the, the liabilities and these things, the actual, you know, the gas production and driftwood itself at, um, you know, one and a half billion dollars total, I'd say subtract off, excuse me, subtract off the $400 million of, you know, net liabilities here. It's about $1.1 $1 .1 billion of, um, of actual cash. So, you know, let's do, uh, this in terms of millions, right? So $1,100 million. And let's just say there's about 800 million shares outstanding. Cause I think they're, they're in a $750 million, sorry, 750 million share range right now. I think we saw that from the most recent filing. Um, so that would be about $1.37 per share. And again, that is after they've paid off their debt. Uh, and so to me, I think that's a bit of a low ball because again, you're valuing Driftwood at basically the money they've put into it, not even any additional value from the fact that, you know, there aren't a whole lot of these out there. And, um, you know, this is one of your best opportunities to get gas on the water fairly soon, but you know, I don't know, uh, that's, that's at least one, one data point. Now, if we figured, let's say, Hey, they get a little bit higher valuation. Let's say they got $2 billion in terms of, you know, what they would value the, the or I guess it would be 1.6 billion for, for driftwood and then $400 million for the gas, uh, the gas production assets that they have, add that together and you're $2 billion. So if it's $2 billion, you would again, subtract off the $400 million of net liabilities they have, call that $1.6 billion after paying those off, divide that by, you know, 800 million shares outstanding. Now you're talking roughly $2 per share. And so I think these are fairly reasonable ranges if they were to get the company to just sell the company outright. And, and I have to imagine that right now, this is this is some of the calculus right when they they use the language and again the, these 
news stories, it's hard. To, yeah, I always have to take them with a grain of salt. Um, but there's probably some truth to them, right? That this Bloomberg article that said, you know, options under consideration include a potential sale of the company, according to people familiar with the situation. Again, I think it's not unreasonable to think that this is one of the things they're at least weighing of how much profit can we make from the tolling model, from you know the, the deals that we're seeing right now that we know we could get from equity partners, from everybody involved versus what can we just get cash right now in our pockets you know and it if they if they really could get that that might be the sorry get you know a dollar fifty two dollars per share you know i mean the company is trading at 25 percent of that you know 30 40 percent of that so that's a significant upside for a lot of shareholders you know i don't know martin is a major shareholder there's also this hedge fund that took a major position recently and again, I don't think I don't think there's any of them that are going to have a, a majority stake in the company anymore. You know, at, at one point, management did have nearly a majority stake in the company very early on in like 2018, 2019, when I first started investing in the company. Um, you know, nowadays, I think their ownership has been scaled back, especially recently as they've been, you know, using that at the market facility to, you know, to fund the company. Uh, but again, there's still major shareholders, they could still probably get enough support for an option if they wanted to do some sort of a buyout like that but who knows it, it, it's really hard to say that's just kind of how i'm looking at it i think from these current levels it's hard to see where a buyout would be a negative for the equity because I, I think they'd have to be valued at above their enough above their current market cap to pay off the liabilities and still have some sort of a you know a return for shareholders and again if they could get you know two dollars right now for shareholders it's 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 a bit hard to say that the the board would not be doing you know their fiduciary duty by by just taking that deal um i think they'd have to really really believe in the company um in the future that they're going to get the, the that they're going to get even more value than that out of of actually developing drift when they're going to be able to do it and you know again i sort of made some some comments on on twitter that you know, now we sort of see what what Sharif was against, and I could actually see this from the personality of Sharif of being like, no, absolutely not. We're not we're not even exploring this as an opportunity or a, a, as an option because you know it's 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 my baby, right? Sh Sharif did not want to to give up the company. He didn't even want that to be an option. That that's my speculation, and I, I could easily see if this was the direction they're going. That at least is a narrative that fits. You know, it fits well. And so this is getting back to what well, caused us. Why why do they oust him? Um, I think he didn't really want to entertain some of these opportunities. I, I think he wanted to drive towards, you know, my, th this is again, this is more speculation, um, slightly even less concrete than all the other speculation I've done so far. But I think he really saw, you know, this business model still as viable. And he thought, you know, sooner or later, the market is going to is going to, to give in and they're going to be able to make the deals that he wants to make and that they're going to be able to make this work. And again, some of the numbers might change. Maybe they'd have to give up a little more equity. Uh, but I think he was always really trying to push for this vertically integrated model because he saw, you know, he saw how great it could be sort of if that first domino were to fall, then a lot of other things fall into place, right? Because their, their plan, all of this was just for phase one of the overall facility, right? For, for a reminder, the overall Driftwood facility is designed for and permitted for, I want to say 27, 27.6 million tons per year of LNG capacity. And phase one is 11, right? So phase one is like one third of the overall facility, 30%, 40%, somewhere in that vicinity. And I think he saw if they could get phase one done in, in a way that would give them enough cash flows, they were going to be self-funding phase two, three, and four. And so the remainder of that facility, which is you know more than half of it, would accrue all of that value to the current shareholders. And that was, I, I think really that was his vision. And again, I think it was also his vision to have this vertically integrated facility where they can they can actually capture that spread um so that, that, it, it, again that is lots of my speculation but i think he just really held to this and saw this as still viable and was probably willing even and this may have been the, the more fundamental disconnect my guess is that he was willing to wait i think he was willing to to wait out the market thinking i'm eventually going to get this deal he was confident and he was willing to take that risk and my guess is the rest of the board 
you know, maybe at some point did go along with him. And maybe that was the big thing in 2022. Maybe they did go along with him waiting out for, for an even better deal than what they had on the table. And they ended up not taking it. And, you know, the entire board and management has seen these, um, has seen just the terms that they can get, get worse and worse and worse since 2022, because the company has gotten in a worse and worse negotiating position. So that's, again, my speculation. Uh, let me see. I see some other, uh, comments here. Um, Vaseline Ball says uh, same range in terms of shares uh, and Driftwood should be the main focus and can sell upstream and buy it back later. Totally agree. I, I mean, I think that's, again, th that's what makes Driftwood, um, sorry, that's what makes Tellurian interesting, right? It, otherwise, it's just a natural gas producer. And I don't think, I shouldn't say nobody's interested in natural gas producer, but that, that's a totally different, um, totally different profit potential. And, and uh, you know, not quite as interesting. Justin Marino says, also think there's a premium on Driftwood given the permanent ban. Absolutely. And I think that's, again, bleeding edge. So it is it is a very interesting time um, now that they've... And it's not a permanent ban. Just to, just to you know be clear on that, it's a pause. We don't know what pause means, right? Now, I, I will sort of inject a little bit of my opinions on, on the government, and, and I'm sure a lot of you probably share this, uh, that, you know, a short pause might end up taking quite a while, might make things much more stringent, might make other other projects actually have to jump through even more hoops, change their designs. Who knows um, in terms of what that would mean? Like it may be that they unpause things within a month, but they actually say now the review process is this much more stringent. We've actually changed our standards and these already approved facilities get grandfathered in. And so they don't have to meet those, but the, everything going forward will. Um it's hard to say. So, so I, 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 it, I don't think it's permanent ban, but I 100% agree with your, uh, with the the general premise of your statement that there should be a premium here, given that it's you know it's fully permitted and and, and approved. Um, all right. And Nathan says Sharif wanted his ego stroke as the godfather of LNG. I hope they sell this thing soon and have it be over with. Creating exit strategy for Tell if they don't sell will be a headache for me. Um, yeah, I think that is the the biggest thing that I'm taking away from them hiring these uh these advisors is that yeah i think they want to do something i have to imagine that the board and you know martin especially is is thinking the same thing right he's he's going on the millions of shares and he's like man i thought we'd have this thing done in 2019 and then you know that all fell through i thought we'd have this thing done in 2022 and that all fell through and you know i'm sitting on all these shares and we're we're not exactly back the drawing board, you know, they, they have a little more progress on, on Driftwood, but in terms of agreements, they're at least looking from the outside of the company, it seems like they're back the drawing board, right? They don't have current offtake agreements. They don't have a whole lot. Of, they have a, some pieces of, of financing, you know, they had that, that um, offering for the site with, for financing from, what was it? Blue Owl Capital. Uh, and so they have had some things that are actually concrete, but again, they're they're basically back at the drawing board in terms of trying to put this thing together. And I, I'm guessing that this model, that you know, the one I'm projecting here on, or showing on the video, if that fell through again, and they're, they're fairly confident that this is not going to happen, they have to figure out even even a different way to make this work. I have to imagine he's feeling the same way. And you know, as the chairman of the board and the largest shareholder, he's set in the direction at at the moment. I think um, so. Yeah, I, mean, I somewhat agree with you. You know, I invested in this years ago thinking, man, I'm going to be patient on this. They'll get things done in a couple of years. And it'll take four or five years to build a facility. And, you know, after six or seven years, they'll have some cash flows coming in. And, you know, after, after I want to say probably six years or so of being invested in the company, that they're still in a similar state. Uh, so it's, yeah. It's not, it's not a great place to be. It's a very high risk place to be at the moment. So I think they're they're trying to do something. All right, Justin Marino says, how much does Tolerance success rely on a Republican president being in office in your opinion? I don't think it does. Um, I think they are already fully permitted, right? They, they had, they, they got all their stuff in 2019 or 2018, uh, maybe maybe a little bit at the beginning of 2019, you know, they, the actual approval for the facility and their export uh, approvals. They are... You know, for, for anybody who's not really deep into the company, they are currently waiting on, they're trying to get an extension, an, an approval for an extension on their timeline from FERC, right? So when they file these uh, initial plans for their facilities, they have a timeline that they set out 
for actually building the facility. And they, they filed this thing. I think I have a link to it. Um, give me a moment. I could probably open it up. Um, yeah, so they, they filed this. I, I believe this is the um, the document. You know, th this is a request for extension of time that they filed for Driftwood LNG. I don't know if I can make this any bigger. Sorry, might be too small for you to see. You know, they, they wanted an additional 36 months to, to build Driftwood. Um, now, if I go down and look, there is a, there's a nice quote in here where they basically... Yeah, so this is the... As a matter of practice, the commission itself generally acts and requests for this... Sorry, let me go down a little bit further. Um, all right, so the commission will not consider... Our, so they open up for comments. They have arguments, yada, yada, yada. The commission will not consider arguments that relitigate the issuance of the certificate order, including whether commission whether the commission properly found the project to be in the public convenience and necessity and whether the commission's environmental analysis for the certificate complied with the national in, national environmental policy act right so they have this language right here saying this is not what we're trying to do we just need an approval for the extension on the timeline the policy is that we shouldn't be re you know reopening up all of these reviews this is just hey we weren't able to get it and they have i'm not a lawyer I, i'm not a professional in this stuff i don't really know but i have to imagine it's a pretty compelling argument to say we need an extension because of covid you know they, they at least have that and that's basically what they called out here where they said um the global upheaval stemming from the covid19 pandemic causing you know, lots of lo lots of issues that's why we weren't able to do it we need an extension this i think is the only time they've they've asked for an extension from them um i think that's true and so I don't think this relies on a on a Republican being in office. I think you know this is just it, it, it is possible that look you might not be wrong. Maybe I'm too optimistic that the government doing you know routine things like this is is not going to you know slow walk and is not going to you know, again shut it down and effectively cancel Driftwood because of. Um, you know, because of policy, you know, sort of behind the scenes policy. I, I don't know, but I, I personally am not super worried about this. I know a lot of, there, there has been a lot of conversation online for people who are really, really into the company on this. This doesn't worry me, but you know, maybe I'm too optimistic. Maybe I'm too naive. You know, this was filed in October and I don't think that it's been granted yet. So, you know, maybe the proof really speaks for itself. Um, Tyson. Hey, Tyson. I, I don't, don't think I've seen you on stream before. What is a premium to Henry Hub in the market today? Suki wanted 275, but here 255 is market today. I don't know. Sorry, um, I'm not enough into the. I'm not enough into the industry to, to really really know that. Um, I, I've I've read things online, but I really can't tell who's a credible source and who's not. Um, I think 255 is in line with some of the things that I've heard, but again, I'm really not sure. Will it rise with worsening Middle East conflict? I don't know. Um, it might, right? So I think it, it is useful to also think, I've, I've talked a lot about the the alternatives in the United States, but it, it's, you have to consider there are alternatives elsewhere in the globe, right? Qatar is a humongous one, obviously. And I do think that some of the stuff that's happening in the Middle East, it, it at least reminds folks. And again, I think Russia also reminded folks that, hey, we should diversify our sources of LNG. And that's kind of always been my take. So on any particular day in any particular facility, you know, maybe it's makes more sense to get it from Qatar or from wherever. Uh, but I, I have to imagine that a lot of the, the, you know, countries that are, they're sourcing the LNG want to intentionally diversify across sources so that they're not all getting it from Qatar or not all getting it from, you know, Russia or not all from the U.S., frankly, because that, that gives, you know, one country, you know, outsized impact on what they can do to you. Whereas if you're diversified across all of them, you know, it, it, it's all, you're, you're more insulated from any one party kind of cutting you off. And so I think that is, um, you're, I think you're, you're right. And that it, in a roundabout way, I think people are still going to sign lots of capacity in the Middle East over the, you know, medium and long term. Uh, but, but I think the seeing those things happen will at least remind people that we should have some diversification. We should have some from the U S you know, no matter what, uh, that that's kind of my take on it. FERC should approve the extension. DUE is more influenced by administration. Okay. Um, I, I don't know the, those intricate details, 
Uh, but I, I, I believe you. Um, that's, that's all, uh, you know, basically all I had to talk through today. I don't know if there's any other uh, questions or comments on, on the stream. I got lots of people on here. I, I, I'm loving this. It looks like it's, uh, 30 people. If I'm seeing that correctly, that is, um, enormous. So thank you all for, for joining in today. That's everything I was going to plan to talk about. Um, I'll stick around and see what else happens on the, on the chat for a couple minutes. Um, I do just FYI, I, I for anybody who is new here, I try to stream about every Sunday about stocks, uh, sometimes Bitcoin. Um, I'm happy to, to look at whatever. I, I'm not tied to any one particular stock. I, I do prefer to talk about the ones that I am personally invested in. I am personally invested in Tellurian. Um, but I've got others that, that I do, do talk about. I also, uh, yeah, I'm also on Twitter, I guess I should say. So I feel free to engage me there. Um, all right, Justin says, my thought is in institutional investors like BlackRock are reluctant to deploy large amounts of capital with Biden's administration and office who is doing everything they can to prevent LNG projects. Yeah, um, you know, you might be right. I think that's certainly possible. It's funny because, you know, a couple of years ago when, when Russia invaded Ukraine, certainly seemed like the Biden administration was softening a lot on that stuff for, for LNG specifically and was saying, you know, I kind of made a flipping comment on, on Twitter that, you know, a couple of years ago, the Biden administration was talking about how we're going to make sure we can get LNG to Europe. We're going to you know get this all going and we're going to kind of be supportive of it. But now it seems like it's been a bit of a 180. Again, I sort of alluded to it a couple of minutes ago. I feel like maybe some of this is, you know, election year politics. I don't know. Um, but you might be right that that might be scaring some, some companies. Then again, at the same time, I think those political or, or let's say regulatory risks have always been there for the, for the, for these companies, right? That, that's always a thing for the energy industry. And I think they're making decisions when they talk about these facilities for, you know, decades. And so it's hard for me to really think with Tolorin already having the permits that they're not looking at this as a sort of just a, a risk of doing business in this industry at all. And so, yes, I think things, at least for a four year period, would be better under a Republican president. Uh, but at the same time, when you're investing in one of these facilities or getting off take from one of them, you, you, you're you planning to do this over 10, 20 plus years, right? And so I don't think that it's not obvious to me that any one administration, any one four year period is going to be, you know, something that really makes or breaks an investment decision for a company. Um, all right. Let's see. Nathan says, if the sale does occur, it seems like there's no better time than now. Is a rough estimate when that could occur? I understand it's completely up in the air. I have no idea. Um, I don't know. Sorry. Th th these things, it could happen fit fast. I, I, I mean... I think to some degree it, it comes down to how motivated is you know Martin and and the board and how fast do these the the, the financial advisors come back to them with something that they're happy with and again as I sort of speculated before we don't really know what the board's motivation is at the moment we don't know if they really want to sell the company if they're trying to to float that idea as as sort of information and data that they can use in some other conversations we don't know if they're trying to only sell part of it right if they're only selling the upstream assets as you know, because they mentioned again, I'm going to go back to the shareholder letter, what, what they've specifically said, they're, you know, they're shaping commercial structure as well as balance sheet management, balance sheet management might be code for we sell the upstream assets to get cash in the door right now, that lets us, you know, pay the debt that we have to pay, have some cash on the books in order to, you know, fund our expenses for now while we're getting everything signed for driftwood. And to, you know, again, give them some just some liability cover to actually switch the business model up to, to a deal that might not be as good as what their most recent presentation, you know, suggested they were going to get, you know, th th this, I think, as you see my spreadsheets in the past, hopefully if you haven't, I have a, a prior video of, you know, Tellurian, uh, you know, valuation model. I've got one that I did, I think in Q4 of last year, you can easily find, hopefully find it on my channel if you just search for that. But, you know, I think if they signed everything today and had, any structure that's all like this and had some amount of their volumes that they can sell at international pricing, you know, again, I think the stock would, I think that the fair value for the stock, if that happened, you know, overnight, again, that would be a miracle. But if that happened overnight, the fair value for the stock would be now closer to 
depending on the details, at, let's say at least $3. You know, it could be 4 or 5 $6. Like, it, it, it's ridiculous if they can make that model work. I think the current stock price is very, very much a reflection of the market skepticism that this is how things are going to go. And again, I think also the board, we don't know what they're actually trying to do. I have to imagine they're pivoting somehow on the business model. We just don't really know to what. And, and, and it's not obvious to me that they're pivoting the business model or trying to sell the company. I could see either one. We, we just don't know. Um, oh, man, lots of comments. Just logged in. Quick overview. Um, the, the quick overview, I, I just kind of walked through a couple options of, you know, uh, a couple options of what it, what it could mean, right? And the, the, the super, super brief overview is, you know, maybe they are actually trying to sell the company. Maybe they're trying to sell just the upstream assets. Maybe they are actually still trying to go with this business model and they're they're getting information from the third party. They're using some of the you know potential pricing they get from the sale of the company to as sort of a negotiating piece for some other folks. I don't know. Hard to say. That that's like the super, super brief 10 second overview of what I talked about. Um Tyson said, or sorry, where am I at? Uh, Nathan says, fair, it's a it's a ludicrous question. Yeah, again, I have no idea. They just haven't given us that much. Um other than to say they've signaled that, that they're motivated to do something. What that is, who knows? Tyson says, election year, Biden appealed to environmental voters. Um, CXL, CP2, and postponing decision until post-election gets votes, but does hurt European support? Yes. Arguable. I missed most of the videos. So are they looking to sell Tal or Driftwood? Um, they're looking to do something. Not quite sure. DEFCON 2 says, any Driftwood deal needs to be worse than the next deal for full funding to happen. That's what I would expect if I were to buy into this as a partner. Tell needs to fully capitulate to anyone who wants to buy in. And I think that is that, that is really the reality, right? And that's why I said there are, you know, if you look at it objectively right now, Tellurian is, you know, they're in terms of operations, they're a small natural gas producer with balance sheet problems that also owns part of a, you know, a partially developed LNG facility. And that position, you know, you and I can see, which definitely means their negotiating counterparties can see. They know that they're not, and that Tellurian is not in a great position uh, to nego negotiate this. And um, I think the, the one, is, so I, I would say two things from that that I, I partially agree and partially disagree. I agree in the sense that their counterparties see that Tellurian is in a weak and weakening negotiating state at the same time. I don't know that the, the deal has to be worse than it was for next. And the reason why I would say that is because Tellurian has put in more money. You know, I think all in, I want to say next decade said that they ended up investing some like $250 million into, you know, in, into the actual equity of Rio Grande. Tellurian has put in a lot more than that already um, into Driftwood. So I don't know that that's, that the deal would have to be worse than next. Um, cause again, the timelines, right? I, I think maybe, and so that's, that's at least if I'm comparing the deal that they did do for, um, you know, phase one of next, if I'm, if I'm looking at, you know, train four for next, sure, maybe you can compare that against Tolorian, but I think the timelines are, are not lined up, right? If you're looking for train four of, of next decade, you're probably not getting that until 2030, 2031. I think if you make a deal with Tolorian, there's a possibility that again, if they made the deal tomorrow, I think they could be getting gas uh, by 2027, if not 2027, 2028, right? So I think the timelines there depends on the buyer, depends what they want. So from that perspective, it's not exactly uh, the same offering at this point. That, that's kind of my thoughts. All right. Um, I should probably hop off. I really appreciate this. This has been a, a great, great chat with, with everybody. Um, but I've been on you for a while, and I don't know that I have anything else to add at this point. Um, Danny G says, thanks. Transient Sacker says, hello from Taiwan. Hi. Um, I am probably going to hop off. All right. Defcon 2 says, fair point, but yes, they're in a bad spot. So why not take advantage of Tell? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Right. So I, I think both are at play and they're sort of um, competing, right? We're, we're on one side. Tell does have something that you want and they have it. You know, maybe they're the best option for getting gas in, you know, on that timeline. But on the flip side, Tell is not in a good negotiating position. So again, where the deal lands, given those sort of competing factors, who, who knows really, you know, which counterparty ends up with the, the better sort of the better deal. I don't know. So, all right. DEFCON 2 says, I think the partners will. It, it, it's certainly possible. Um, Tyson says, thanks. Trenton Sacker says, just changing plans here. All right.
Cool. Well, um, I'm gonna hop off. Thanks for everybody who who joined the stream. I really appreciate it. This was um this was awesome. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully you got some value out of it. See ya. Thanks. Hoping we get to start see some uh feeling some some good news. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Accumulating some good news. Yeah. All right. Take care, everybody.